What's happening? It's your boy Ross Mack, Mr. Maconomics, Mr. Wall Street Rapper. And you're getting in tune with Catch the Wave Podcast. <laughs> oh. Welcome to the first episode of the Catch the Wave Podcast. My name is Landon Buford, and I have Mr. Maconomics, the Wall Street Rapper, Ross Mack on the line. How are you doing today? Man, I'm doing good, brother. How you living? Trying, trying to hang out in there, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents, you know? That's the way. During this That's pandemic, so... You know how that goes. Absolutely. And you're the man to talk to since you 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 know you know all about the uh, the investments and all this other stuff. So I, fe- I feel like you know our our community needs this. So that's why I had you on it today. Man, I appreciate you having me. I agree, man. The community, our community, definitely needs you know some positive figures talking about you know money, talking about how to bridge um, you know the wealth gap, how to build generational wealth. Yes, sir. Um, I know, uh, for, first of all, I got to ask you about this 2K uh, uh, placement for, your, uh, for, your, for your, one of your new singles. Can you tell us about the single? And then also, can you tell us how that process came about? Yeah, man, good. You know, so I was lucky enough to get a song called A Dub, uh, A-D-U-B, A Dub, um, on NBA 2K21. It's lit, you know what I mean? The song is a vibe. Just a pure, you know, energetic wave of just saying how much you need money. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's, I think everybody can relate to that. And, you know, I was lucky enough. I distributed the song through United Masters and I was able to get the song on 2K. So it was lit. I know I know. Uh, Dame Dalla had a lot of influential on the soundtrack. I mean, how, how I guess, with him doing what he's doing now in the NBA and obviously able to transfer over into the music world, what are your thought process about him working on this project that you're featured on? Man, I, I got a lot of respect for Dame. He didn't, I mean, he's obviously top five point guard, but he might be even be closer top three right now. He's balling. Um, I respect his, uh, his musical abilities as well. He could definitely flow a little bit. You know, one of my homies, uh, Jeremiah got a couple songs with him, so I definitely, you know, been in tune even before he got on this 2K. So I rock with Dane heavy. He he different on the court. I rock with him super heavy. Okay. Right, let me pull these questions up. Um, uh, you obviously you have a background in uh, uh, in in uh, Ivy League background, uh, and you folk you release content focused on financial literacy. Why do you feel that it's more prominent than ever for minorities to start investing in the stock market compared to other things where they might not see a return on their investment? Well, the way I look at the stock market is it's almost like one of the greatest kept secrets. And when you look at it, I want to say over 80 plus percent of the stock market is owned by, you know, 1%, right? Like Mm -hmm. owned by, you know, whites. And as a result, when it comes to our community, the stock market is just one of the best kept secrets that's going to allow you to make residual income, you know, that passive income where you're no longer thinking about it, right? You make some sound investments. You do the work early, figure out what you need to invest in. And from there, you're just sitting back doing nothing, allowing your money to work. Because once people start understanding it, you know, it's a strong distrust in our community mm-hmm. where, you know, and it's rightfully so, right? You know, but it's a strong dis- distrust in our community where it came from banks and not wanting to invest and not even knowing how to invest. And so when you think about it, you know, the stock market itself is something that a lot of people, you know, a lot of our people are afraid about or just more importantly, haven't been exposed to it. And so for me, it's like, let me, um, you know, bring this to the forefront. Let me uh, make it more easily digestible for our community to even understand what the stock market is. And from there, it's like, we definitely should be making money because it's one of the best ways to generate generational wealth. It is, you know, like I say, it's one of the best kept secrets. And a lot of people, unfortunately, haven't been exposed to it, right? I don't think I really learned about the stock market until I was a grown man. And, you know, by grown, I mean, like 18, 19, mm-hmm. when I first really saw it when I was in college. But, like, I want shorties to be 12 years old owning stocks. I want them to be, you know, following CNBC like they watch ESPN or they follow StockX, right? Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, stock market is one of those amazing things that our community don't know about. And it's like, it's about time we do have you, um, obviously, like I said, you had the Ivy League background. Um, really, you, I mean, you've been on Wall Street. Have you thought about going, you know, basically, you know, teaching classes outside of, you know, your, you know, your, 
your some of your other ventures that you have of like Revolt, and I mean, um, obviously, you know, you, uh, on your musical side, you uh, run the um, the uh, several different entities. But have you thought about actually like partnering with a university and actually teaching it, or maybe even partnering with a high school? Because you know, some of these cr the criteria that's being taught is not helpful. What they're learning in school is not helpful. We we both been with the school, so. Uh, it's not being helpful to, in being able to translate into the real world opportunities as well. Yeah, I, I definitely see something like that being in the, you know, near term future. And I think um, you spoke on a great point, right? You know, mm -hmm. the curriculum that we have growing up, a lot of it doesn't translate to, you know, real life uh, experiences, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing, uh, you know, the sine, cosine, or the, you know, isosceles triangles and things mm -hmm. of that sort doesn't translate to, oh, you know, how does my credit translate to my buying power? Or why X, Y, Z, or what's investing or, you know, and there's so many things that a lot of, you know, a lot of children aren't exposed to and that's I mean, the, the big thing is their parents aren't exposed to it. And so mm -hmm. I think that schools definitely need to do a better job of that. And so with that being said, I'm definitely in the process of one, developing my own curriculum that people can, you know, download, but also I would love to partner with, you know, high schools as well. I'm actually, you know, got a few things like that in, uh, in, uh, in motion right now. Okay. Um, I, like I said a little bit earlier, you, you cur currently have a segment uh, with Revolt called uh, Maconomics. Can you take us through the partnership uh, process and how it all came about? Yeah, um, Maconomics is a digital brand that I have uh, where it literally is about educating our community, right? It's trying to take some very hard topics and mm -hmm. making it more relatable, right? So my background is, you know, <clears throat> from the south side of Chicago. Um, went to great high school, that being Whitney Young, went to an Ivy League school, was in the Warden School of Business at UPenn. And from there, I went and worked on Wall Street for, call it over five, six years. You know, worked at Morgan Stanley, came to a hedge fund in Chicago, um, Grover Capital. And once I got back to Chicago, it was like, yo, I got to now get more in tune with my community because things that I took for granted, I started to understand a lot of people just don't know about, right? And so it was like, how do I bring wall street to main street and that's what maconomics is right it's like i'm gonna speak the same languages an everyday person that look like me and more importantly i'm going to take a complex topic mm -hmm. or something that a lot of people is consider taboo you know when it comes to money a lot of people don't talk about it it's like let's bring that you know and make it really easy and digestible uh and allow people themselves to interact with it make it very quick and concise and now it's like okay i just took away some gems and so i started making videos on my own platform and you know I, I ended up getting some real organic love and one of the great things was that I knew a few people that worked at Revolt um, and they were pitching the show and as a result you know Revolt picked it up and you know I'm always grateful for them because you know me and Revolt together are now able to help push the culture forward and really help educate our people and I really love what Diddy and the entire staff is doing over there. Um I know because of COVID-19, a lot of the production has been shut down, but what, do you know roughly when we could see a, the, 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 uh, some of the, some of new uh, upcoming episodes uh, on Revolt specifically uh, of the program? Yeah, well, for starters, I put out weekly content regardless, so you could always get in tune. That's I'm Ross Mac, or go to my YouTube under Ross Mac, R-O double dollar sign Mac or just type in Maconomics. Yeah. Um, but in terms of Revolt, we're probably going to start, uh, you know, season two soon. Obviously, you know, um, you know, it's things that are above my pay grade that are probably happening, especially with kind of, you know, everything going on with the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, but right now, yeah, we're, we're just, you know, getting ready to start production for season two, though. I know that um, after, you know, you used your time on Wall Street to finance your your whole music career basically mm -hmm. um for artists out there that don't understand um i guess you know you have to either invest yourself in yourself at the beginning or you're taking the music music companies are investing in you throughout your career um i guess obviously it depends on you know your finances and stuff like that but how i guess in your opinion how important is it to actually get some of your own stuff into things like 2k on your own prior to even be 
you know, prior to even going to like a, a, a signing a record deal, in your well, opinion? I think so. At the end of the day, you ask yourself why a person signs a record deal, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it could be, you know, I'm trying to take my my craft to the next level. Mm -hmm. AKA I need investment into this to push it from a marketing standpoint or other people are signing a deal just because they need money in their pocket. Right. And I think, you know, I've been lucky enough to, you know, work very lucrative careers as well as, you know, be very entrepreneurial. But for me, it's like, once you start understanding how music itself makes money, then you start figuring out you may or may not need a record deal. Right. And so, you know, I think it's important for people to start thinking about creating music, at the most cost efficient matter. I personally record all my music at home. So I'm not spending, call it $50, $60 an hour to go to a studio to record it. You know what I mean? I made the early investments. I got a decent mic, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, a Neumann, I got, you know, uh, Avalon and, you know, all those things as like, make that early investment in yourself. And then from there, now you're able to start saving money as you move forward, learn how to record yourself. And then it's like, okay, how do I distribute my music, right? There's so many things like CD Baby and Distro Kid, and obviously I use United Masters. Um, and when it comes to using like a United Masters, they not only are gonna allow you to keep your masters, but they also help you try to get your music placed, right? And by place, I mean like sync and licensing opportunities, right? I have, um, although I use, uh, and I would also look into it, not just from, you know, the distribution standpoint, but also Google, you know, licensing companies, right? Those are the people that's going to help you get your music and movies, right? I had, you know, a song and um, this year, one of the, not one of, it was at the time, um, Amazon's number one show. Um, I can't even think of the name of it right now, whole time. Um, but I had a song in there. It's yeah. called uh, Outer Banks, Outer Banks. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a song in there. I've had, you know, several uh, songs in BET shows, um, you know, Showtime, you know what I mean? The Shy. And so it's all about just, you know, did some stuff with the uh, Ball in the Family, LeVar Ball in the f and Lonzo Ball in them show. Like at the end of the day, man, it's like, how do you get your music, you know, outside of just, you know, like back in the day, the idea was like uh, a success was getting your song on the radio. Mm -hmm. And now we understand like, you know, it's so many other places to put your music. Like I want to get it in, you know, not just TV shows. I want to be in music. I mean, I'm sorry, movies. I want to be in a motion picture. I want to be on some Disney movie or some, you know, Lionsgate movie. And that's when it's, when it's lit fast and furious type mm -hmm. vibe. You know what I mean? Um, I know, hold on, let me pull up this next question. Um, Master P, now uh, 21 Savage, and obviously yourself have been preaching about financial literacy for a while now. If the three of you could make a album together based on financial liter uh, literacy, how many tracks would it, do you want it to have and uh, the project to have? Wait, say, say, uh, I heard the last part. What three people? Say it again. Master P, yourself, and 21 Savage, if you guys were going to make a project together strictly on financial literacy, um, how many tracks would you want on that specific uh, project? Man, to be able to work with Master P, he a, a, a legend. You know what I mean? I definitely rock with 21, 21, 21. So that being said, you know, I think I think we would try to get in the studio and make as many songs and many records as possible. I don't think it's no right number. I think once you make them, once you make as many songs as possible, then we kind of go down and start narrowing it down to see if it if it really sticks. But I think when you think about a person who truly um, had a blueprint that a lot of people actually follow. You look at the cash monies of the world and, you know, TDs and whatnot, like no limit set the bar very high. And so when you look at a person like Master P, you know, it'd be an honor to work with him because he, he truly understands financial literacy to the fullest, right? You know, he, he, he was able to really open the doors for a lot of people, especially musicians, right? And it's like, he understands that. And, you know, I definitely see what 21's doing. You know, now he's branching out into financial literacy. I think, you know, that's the thing about my music. It's like, I want to make the type of music that you're going to ride to and listen to, but at the same time, you're going to be like, oh shit, let me rewind that. Cause now I just heard something. What are you talking about? What's the S&P 500? He, what's call spreads? What's who? And that's kind of how I'm coming. You know what I mean? It's always about educating while simultaneously entertaining. And that's, you know, kind of the Ross Mac brand as a whole. When can, when can we see a, a new project from you, like a full blown project? Is, are you working on something right now? 
Um, is it, you know, is it going to be released later this year? Are we think, looking more towards next year? What's your thought process on that? Oh, yeah. More music definitely coming out ASAP. I got a few videos I'm going to drop from my most recent project called Maconomics 101. Mm -hmm. um, definitely get into it if you haven't heard that. Um, and yeah, more music coming out. You know what I mean? Definitely more music before the year's over. You know, I try to put out as much music as possible, right? It's, at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot of music out here. So you just got to keep putting music out. Um, you know, I'm definitely, I'm always working. I'm in a studio constantly. That's, that's the name of the game. You, uh, like you said, you've seen a lot of success with your content, especially now, cause you know, everybody's looking for, you know, educational, um, platforms, I guess, I guess, uh, how successful has uh, a lot of your content been being that a lot of people have been home and be able to, you know, search, uh, specific things while during this COVID where they didn't have much of entertainment going on because of, it, of the shutdown. Yeah, I think I think I've seen a massive surge in kind of my overall engagement when it comes to the audience that I've been curating. Right, it's mm -hmm. you know a lot. Like people aren't going out to the clubs as much. People aren't going or leaving from work. So as a result, they glue to their cell phones and their computers. Right, and with that being said, not only that, a lot of people out here, unfortunately, laid off, and as a result, they're searching for answers. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm the person that I believe at I happen to, I, I put myself in a great position to be a, a very trusted source for people to be like, you know what, let me go look what Mac and Namis got to say about this topic, or let me DM this person, or let me DM Ross Mac to actually figure it out. And so for me, you know, it's been a good opportunity to actually educate the community. And that's what I've been trying to do over all these, you know, COVID months of just being at home. I know uh, we were supposed to get a, another stimulus check that doesn't seem like it's coming anytime soon. Um, for the people that are out of work, but they're looking, you know, they're not, they're trying to be productive and find something. What are your thoughts? What can, what can they actually do um, in your opinion to help generate, um, you know, wealth during this particular time? Yeah. I mean, one of the things I actually did something a couple of weeks ago with bank of America and we were discussing kind of the new realm, the new idea of just working from home as a whole, like, how does that look? Right. And I think that this opportunity should have, really made people a little more hungry, a little more grittier with the grind, right? It's like, how can you um, get smarter with your money? One, you know, one, I, one way of making more money um, without doing extra is literally just de decreasing your expenses, mm -hmm. right? You're, if you, you know, if you make a hundred dollars, but you're spending $80 each month, you really only got 20. But yeah. if you make that same hundred and now you're only spending 50, now you got $50, right? And so the idea is one way is just lowering your expenses, trying to figure out what do you believe is truly necessary versus what you just want. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, you know, budgeting better. And then from there, you know, for the people that are trying to make more money, it's like, how can you now take whatever talent you have um, and now start monetizing that, whether it's, you know, like creating some type of class, whether it's how to crochet, how to, you know, how to, you know, how to educate your kids, how to entertain your kids from home. Like there's so many different things that you can start doing, um, start learning different, you know, digital marketing um, type of things. But I think at the end of the day, it's all about trying to pivot. Life is all about pivoting. You know, when you have an obstacle, it's all about, you know, how you face that. And for a person that's, you know, out of work, you know, unfortunate as it is, but it's like, obviously there are other jobs that are hiring, maybe not as much as before, but, you know, with the, with the, with, with technology, you're now able to effectively be your own boss and you can now just get a little more creative with finding ways of trying to make money. Um, obviously, you know, shut down, people trying to do, you know, uh, pass the time. How do you think the entertainment and financial space will change once we find a vaccine for COVID-19? Um, you say, how does the entertainment and the financial space change? Yeah, like, you know, once, because obviously a lot of entities are, you know, closing their doors forever. So what it basically, what do you feel like it's going to look like once, whenever we find a cure and we can possibly go back outside without having an issue to wear masks and things of that nature? I think what's going to occur is that a lot of businesses are going to understand that because they work at this time, call it a vaccine, ready, call it earliest would be beginning of 2021. So realistically people would have been working an entire year kind of with this new world. I think what happens once the vaccine happens, a lot of companies gonna understand they don't need 
to have everyone in the office to be productive, right? A lot of companies have been more productive working from home. People will continue to use Zoom, right? I think there'll be less, um, uh, I think there'll I think there'll be less commercial real estate, right? I don't think, you know, to a lot of the companies out there that get, you know, seven floors of office space, they probably only need two, maybe three, right? Um, I was talking to a CEO and he was telling me like, yeah, I think we're going to downsize because this is letting everyone know, like, you could be more efficient working from home. I think that um, there will be a lot of companies that shut. Um, I think this is, you know, what I, what I look at, COVID-19 was did, all it did was just accelerate some of the things that were inevitable. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is a lot of people themselves were not, um, well, a lot of businesses themselves um, weren't adjusting to kind of the new digital world of, mm -hmm. um, you know, things on demand, right? People need to be able to buy food on demand. People mm -hmm. need to be able to shop on demand. Everyone wants convenience. Um, you know, restaurants are going to have to really build out their, um, you know, that takeout menu and things of that sort. But yeah, the world's going to be different even when, um, you know, vaccine happens. Like a lot of the stuff that has occurred, occurred over this past year will continue to be the new norm as people say, oh, I don't need to go to work. I don't need to travel for work. I, you know, people are going to continue to build out home, rooms in their home as their new office. What do you think is going to, how this is going to affect um, people's salaries because like they don't have to pay major overhead for people to become in the office, you know, gas, you know, uh, gas prices, things of that nature. They don't have to pay all that now if they can just say we're going to work from home. So if somebody's asking for like a hundred thousand or whatever it is because of whatever they feel that they need to do. Right. How is that going to affect by people working from home? How's that going to affect in your opinion, people's salaries going forward? Is it going to decrease them or do you think they'll increase? even more well i think it depends right if you're if if we're talking about companies that have been able to remain profitable um i think salaries either stay the same or go up you know there have been some jobs where because of their their profitability hasn't been the same some people have to take pay cuts but from your standpoint of you know if you know for a company that stay you know has been able to maintain you know sales or whatnot and revenue i think that their stay at home, their take home pay should be more largely because you're probably saving a lot of money. A lot of people aren't taking into account, right? You're no longer, you know, buying those fancy clothes or going to the office. Mm -hmm. um, you no longer have that, the, the higher dry cleaning bill. You're no longer eating out um, as much. That being, you know, $20 every day or so for lunch and coffee. Um, you're not the commute. You no longer have that long uh, commute. Uh, or costly commute gas and car maintenance and things of that sort. So it's a lot of different things, but I think overall, um, you know, take home pay probably is a little up. Maybe we'll see. Um, I guess uh, getting into a little of uh, what you do, um, what have you been seeing right now as far as like investments? Um, obviously, you know, people's got to do their own research, but you know, what do you see, you know, um, some of these stocks growing for people over the last maybe two months? Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing is, like I say, the inevitable, you know, the companies that have been able to adapt the quickest are the most profitable companies now, that being largely tech companies, um, companies that have been able to benefit from the new stay at home world. Um, you know, you, you're going to continue to see tech be the, the, the leading uh, driving force behind, you know, profitability on Wall Street, like that's the new norm, right? You, you know, you're going to want to look at all these tech companies. You got the Amazons, the Teslas, the Apples of the world, the Zooms, the, the Wayfares. These are all monstrous companies where when it comes to kind of uh, big box retailers, the few that are going to stay um, relevant are the ones that won, you know, the United States government considered to be essential. So mm -hmm. they were able to stay open during those few months when all businesses for the most part had to close. Right. So you see mm -hmm. target with record numbers and stuff like that. And so you're going to, you're going to continue to see, you know, people leaning towards at home entertainment, you know, people shying away from, you know, travel uh, hotel sectors and stuff like that airlines and stuff like that, but people want convenience. People want everything on demand. So whether it's movies on demand, whether it's groceries on demand, um, clothes on demand, like, you know what I mean? So that, that, that's how I look at it. Um, I know that you were part of All-Star Weekend last year um, with the Mountain Dew um, uh, courtside. Um, it looks like they're not going to be 
uh, having All-Star Weekend in Indiana, and that's like right next door to you. Um, it, prior to this happening, were you planning on going to Indiana and having something, um, you know, being a part of something else next year as well? No, um, good question. Um, I, I haven't even been able to really formulate my mind around it. I know I've worked with an agency who kind of, like you say, worked with Mountain Dew in the past. And in the event that that was another opportunity to help do um, kind of experiential marketing, you know, have an experiential marketing company. Mm-hmm. This right here is the drill. It's the drill. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, you know, they had to cancel it, but it's rightfully so. So we'll see, you know, if it, if it is able to pick back up moving forward. I know the Bulls have been um, in the news a lot. You know, they just let their coach go. Um, they, you did some business with the, uh, the Ball family. Uh, LaMelo has been, uh, I guess, uh, been in the mix to possibly land with the Bulls. Um, what are your thoughts about what's going on with your hometown um, franchise? Bulls are trash. They need to they need pick me up. Let me get a 10-day contract, and we're good. I promise you we'll, we'll be better than what we was last year. But no, no, seriousness, the Bulls have to figure a few things out. Definitely need a decent um, – we definitely need a great coach, but we got to just land that one person in free agency and just start the rebuild. Um, obviously, we got some good keys, but I'm cool with starting scratch with the exception of maybe leaving like two or three players on. But we just got to do the rebuild. It's a process, and it's going to take a minute, but we got to get there. You think that? Do you think the the, the I guess the departure, and then I guess you guys thought. Uh, well, many thought that you guys were back on track when D Rose came in, winning the MVP. This is pre injury. You know, good job for him to get back. But I mean, how close do you guys think you guys were with that team without D Rose being injured? I guess you could say. That was one of, I mean, outside of, you know, the, our best team was obviously the Jordan era, but yeah. D. Rose, Jimmy Butler, and Noah was on the team. I think if we would have swapped out um, Boozer, Carlos Boozer, weak ass, and we had Luau Dang, we would have been straight. All we needed was a, a better person other than uh, Boozer. We needed some shooters. Um but, you know, I think uh, – I mean, we was we was solid. D. Rose was one of the greatest to ever do it at, at his height, at his height. You know what I mean? Everybody always rooting for D. Rose because he home team. He, he, he one of the greatest to ever do it and lace him up for the Bulls. That's a fact. Um, but, you know, if he would have never got hurt, we definitely would have had a ring or two by now. Um, you know, the thing was always trying to get past uh, Bron. Mm-hmm. But um, if we, if we would have got one other person, we would have been straight. If we would have had one other star – alongside Rose because at that time Jimmy Butler wasn't a real star yet right um, he's kind of coming into his own but if we would have had one star we would have been straight you guys had Wade but I mean he was I mean I th- he was he was injured yeah we, we got Wade when he was watched Wade's supposed to came in like I want to say 2012 um that year when he re- when Brown went Brian there. over there yeah that was yeah, that was only yeah, yeah Wade was too watched when we got him what are your thoughts on like just the playoff situation um, right now? I mean, obviously the Lakers, I guess, choked last night. I'll just say it. They choked last night, um, but they don't have. They didn't choke. They not, they, they probably, I genuinely think, so, so I love, so the, so the first question, what I think of the playoffs, I love them. I like this right now because right now it's letting you know who's really good and who isn't. Mm-hmm. You don't got no outside noise. You ain't got mm-hmm. no crowd engagement. This mm-hmm. is just, you know, real gritty, right? Obviously, um, you know, when LeBron and them lose, because they are going to lose, people are going to be like, oh, well, they they were the first place team. They didn't get to have home court advantage. That's That really is an impact, yada, yada, yada. Like, at the end of the day, you're probably going to have Clippers um, in either the Bucks or uh, Toronto, believe it or not, in the finals. I got uh, Clippers winning, but I also will say if Portland beat the Lakers, they might not be able to get stopped. Um, and I do believe Portland beats the Lakers. They don't have nearly enough pieces on that team. But I think the Clippers is the most complete team. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just starting to get their team back. Mm-hmm. Um, they definitely the best team in the West. They best team in the league. It's just a function if they all play together. Um, I, I still like Houston beating Thunder. Um I mean, everything else, it is what it is. But I do like Portland beating uh, LeBron. But we'll see. We shall see. 
So you got you got you got playoff P actually living up to the playoff P name and not getting ousted in the first round for the first time in seven years or something like that. Play, see the thing about uh, Paul George that I love was when he was with Indiana, he was supposed to beat LeBron that year with him and Roy Hebert and um, whatever the little the, the, their personal issues got in the way. But yeah, we'll, we'll leave that alone. Yeah, but um, you know it, it it is what it is. I think um, I think. I think that uh, Clippers got the most complete team. Obviously, the two-headed monster, Kawhi and Paul George. And then you just got some dogs coming off the bench. And then they, they, they got the best defensive team in the in the arguably ever when you start really looking at all the individual pieces. Mm -hmm. Paul George, defensive player of the year type of candidate. Kawhi, defensive player of the year type of candidate. Well, at least defensive all mm -hmm. first team. Then you obviously you got the – the dog, Pat Beverly from Chicago, who's a defensive animal. Then you got, um, what's my dog uh, with the, the – Or uh, uh, Lou. No, Lou, Lou, the sixth man of the, of the decade, not even the year. Uh, but I'm talking about um, the, the, the center who just played his first game. Montrez. Montrez, Harold, yeah. He a defensive animal. Like, they, they just really good, complete, complete team. They they really are good. You got um the guy that looked like Bobby Schmurter coming off the bench. I'm we gonna really see how that how that uh works. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Buddy from uh, he played with the Pistons and just mm -hmm. came over there. Mm -hmm. I know who you're talking about. He got in it with, with Westbrook uh a couple years ago. Yes, sir. I know who you're talking about. Yes, sir. That's little Bobby Schmurter, but they got a team, bro. They, they different. They you different. Uh, you said the Lakers are gonna lose in the first round. If that does happen, you you think it is gonna happen. What do they or what are they gonna need to do this offseason? Because obviously that falls on Rob Polinka and the way he's built this team out, right? If I was if I was Rob, everybody can go. All guards should go. Now one they shouldn't keep one guard on that team. Every guard should be cut. Uh Caldwell Pope needs to not be in the NBA. He's trash. He's only there because of LeBron. That's the only reason why he's there. I don't understand how he's in the league. Um Danny Green is – he got to be able to hit shots. But they don't got no point guard, you know what I mean? And I think they did they did very bad all season. They should have got a real, you know, a guard. Do you, they should, you think they should have traded – do you think they should have traded for your boy D. Rose? Do you think they should have traded that first round – or that second round pick and uh, what's the name for D. Rose? Yeah, without a doubt. D. Rose on that team where he doesn't have to be the best player. D. Rose – any team where he doesn't have to be the best player is still a GOAT. Um, you know, Ray John Rondo obviously he hurt, but he still can't shoot, right? Like you gotta be able to space right. the floor in this NBA. Um, and you know, they they they're very tall, you know what I mean? They got, you know, about three seven footers with A D and Dwight and um JaVale McGee weak ass, but nonetheless, like they need guards. No one can shoot on their team. It's disgusting that they even are allowing half these people. Cools, I like cools. You know what I mean? But it, it they need real guards or they're never going to be good. So you, you, you're you not sold on waiters or you're not sold on uh, J.R. Smith? No, absolutely not. So you think that they might have, should have probably signed Melo and Crawford instead? If they could have, they had opportunity to sign uh, Jamal Crawford without a doubt. Um, but I mean, that we'll see, right? At the end of the day, you know, this is early. Right. I, well, I they, think might they, find, they might find a way to figure it out. You never know. They gotta figure it out, but they don't have the team to win. Right. LeBron is one with less, arguably, but he still always had a couple shooters, right? Ray Allen saved his life a couple times right. and Kyle Corver and them, but like he's he's not gonna be able to um win with the with with these people that's why he was trying to get Corver over there you got to get a jamal or somebody you know they're they, that thing that they can shoot. and you sh the thing is these guys i mean it could be you know they haven't played in a week so maybe they come back but portland different i said this a long time ago to all my homies i said the moment lebron went to the west his legacy was going gonna get a lot more convoluted a lot a lot more tarnished because he was able to dominate the east because the east was trash the moment he went to the west i told people i say bro the west has been so good so long ask yourself like you know how many great teams like if you could have took any team mm -hmm. um even a, the old school portland not not this one or or the thunder or if you just would have put them in the east they would have dominated the east yeah. like east was trash lebron genuinely 
hasn't had to really get past anyone. The best team he had to get past was the What's old your Bulls. What's your the, Bulls? So the old Celtics, and then you had the Bulls, and then after, you know, the Bulls started getting hurt, then it was like, okay, he got the Pacers, bad. maybe. Yeah, the, like, like the East has been um, historically trash, right? And then um, now in the West, it's different. <laughs> that was different. Brian going to have a very hard time being in the West. Um, and so we'll see, you know what I mean? At the end of the day, he got, he got, you know, a great, a few good things out of it. He got a couple movie deals out of it, but you know, if he wanted to continue to build his legacy, he should have stayed in the East and just bought, you know, a few more players to wherever he was at. But the West is different. The West is really great. When you, anytime you got teams where anytime you got times where people like Devin Booker isn't making the playoffs, it's different, right? Yeah. Anytime you got Portland as an eighth seed, that if Portland was in the is in the East and they played their games against Eastern Conference team, they would be a top three team. They would the be time. a top three. T- they would, they'd probably be a top three team in the West if they had their whole roster this year. Yeah, to be honest. We're we gonna see. I know. I like you said. You you said Devin Booker. Uh, Devin Booker. Um, you think that's the type of, of player that the Lakers need? Because he can, he can score the ball. He can score the rock. They can't, afford, they can't afford him. He's a max contract player. They can't afford him. But look, I got a hop, bro. All, All right, right, I got you. Much love, dog. Let me know.